All right, party people. We have another episode of Below the Hotline for you, where listeners call in with any question at the intersection of creation, philosophy, and technology, which is where this podcast sits. So if you dig these conversations, hit the hell out of that subscribe button. Whether it's on your podcast player, whether it's on YouTube, smash that subscribe button, hit that like button, um, drop in a comment, or dial 424-272-6640. That is the hotline number, which is also in the show notes if you have a question yourself. So today, our sponsor is Magic Mind for this episode, and long story short, just go get it and try it. It is the anchor of my morning ritual, something that I developed over seven years, but really into a company two years ago. And really for five years, it was just, how do I get the most out of my morning ritual? Um, I'm not going to tell you the whole story. I'm not going to give you the whole pitch, but I will say everyone that tries is like, holy shit, this is really, really good. Um, And it's good for two reasons. One, it tastes good. Now it tastes good. It didn't. Uh, and I haven't always been able to say that, but now it actually tastes really good, but also it gets you into a productive creative flow for seven to eight hours. Take it in the morning alongside your morning coffee or tea, and you are dialed in for the rest of the day. So go check it out, magicmind.co and enter promo code BTL for below the line for 20% off. And then feel free to at me on Twitter. If you, if you don't like it for any reason, I'll personally give you a refund. Just tweet at me and I'll process it. That's how uh, how much I know you're going to dig it. All right, let's jump into today's voicemail for uh, this episode of Below the Hotline. Hey, James, uh, this is Ajay calling from Los Angeles. Uh, big fan. Ajay in LA. What's up? Onward. Another podcast. Um, so I'm, I wanted to ask you a question because I have heard you talk a little bit about Vedanta in the past. Uh, as a philosophy um, and a religion, I'm not sure. Um, and I, I know it's something you've found helpful in your career, um, and I'm curious about what exactly it is, uh, how you gravitated there, and how you found out about it. Um, so yeah, I would, lo- would love to know more about Vedanta. Thank you so much. All right, Ajay, thank you for the question. What is Vedanta? I don't... Well, I, I'll say off the bat, it's a philosophy and not a religion. There's no like ritual to it. There's no um, mysticism. There's no like thou shalt um, to it. It's it's a five thousand year old uh, Indian philosophy that that uh, more or less sits at the seat of and the source of all other Eastern philosophies. Uh, the lineage runs back to Vedanta. Um, you have Hinduism as a cultural religion built on top of um, the philosophy of Vedanta. You have Buddhism, as the adage goes, Buddhism is Hinduism made for export as it leaves India and goes into China. You have Zen as a derivation of Buddhism that then enters Japan, but you follow those back and they go to this uh, five, seven, ten thousand year old philosophy of Vedanta. Um, I guess I'll round out a little bit of the historicity of it and it's uh, often referred to as, uh, there are a few different references that you could make to Vedanta, but Advaita Vedanta, specifically the philosophy that I really love, which translates to non-dual, um, end of knowledge is what it translates to. Um, and so what is non-dual end of knowledge? That's uh, that is a good question that I don't even know how to properly answer. Um, so I will cheat and say, the first off, check out this book called Vedanta Treatise. It's like a $50 book. It's kind of expensive. I, there is no e you know, there's no electronic version. Um, and for all I know it, I think it has like, you know, 30 reviews on Amazon, but it is the most I think it's the most influential book I've ever I've ever read, um, and this philosophy uh, is is at the heart of. It's come up in different podcast episodes. I mention it every every once in a while. You could check out one of the episodes called "Yoga for the Intellect," which um, which we talk about 
uh, chat with a, a uh, surfer monk um, about Vedanta in depth, but um, the, the role it has had in my life, that's the, that is the, the best way I think I should answer the question, is that it, it is philosophy plus psychotherapy in, in, in one that I invest in and think about each day. Uh, each morning. And where I got there was at eight, our dad taught us to meditate. Uh, when we were really young, when I was eight years old, uh, my dad in Dallas, Texas taught us to meditate. It was very strange uh, in a waspy Dallas, Texas, but I'm now, I just, inv- I, I think it's, uh, I'm so thankful now looking back that he did. My friends would come over and, and be like, why is your dad napping on the porch um, at 2 p.m.? And uh, he's meditating, and I thought he, hell, I thought he was napping for 10 years. But that then led to an openness towards um, Eastern philosophy and Eastern religions, but really Eastern um, philosophies, I, I think, is a better word for things like Buddhism or uh, or Vedanta. They're, they're not really religions um, in a Western sense. And... And then in my twenties, I was at just, I was just basically running into the ground over and over and over again with my operating system, my psychology in which I made decisions, chose projects, um, chose attachments. And it was just like, wasn't even running into the ground. It was like magnetized to run into the ground over and over and over again, um, and it was through multiple attempts at building companies and ultimately um, involuntary successful self-annihilation of trying to build different companies and hitting, I say low points, but really it was uh, reducing and reducing and reducing layers of, of um, parts of me that weren't helpful and uh, psychologies and, and attachments that weren't helpful, and I end I end up coming across this this uh, guy, this uh, philosopher from the 20th century, Alan Watts, who I've had on the podcast, um, I think in December last year, and uh, so check out that episode if you're interested. And this philosopher just happened to record thousands and thousands of hours of his lectures that break down and translate Eastern philosophy for a Western audience. And I love these. I mean, it was just, uh, it was basically uh, therapy on um, autopilot when I would listen to these lectures and reorient my thoughts on what I thought was super important at the time towards maybe entertaining certain uh, different prioritizations. And Alan Watts is famous for saying that he was a stand up philosopher and to not take anything he said with a microphone in front of a crowd any more seriously than listening to Mozart and and really just view it as entertainment. And yet that, that uh, disarming nature of his words and his viewpoints, if you just YouTube Alan Watts um, and then go for maybe the most ranked by most viewed videos, you can see some of the things that... Uh, that he said that resonate with people and, um, and by disarming it with just, Hey, this is entertainment. This is not, I'm not trying to sell you on anything. I'm not trying to convert anyone on anything. This is me just with an instrument. And my instrument is, um, being a wordsmith and that disarming nature in the lectures and the, for me, it felt like was hitting on these universal truths that I, felt like I knew but was programmed and hypnotized to think differently. It was an unwinding of sorts to listen to him. So ended up listening and reading and spending thousands of hours with Alan Watson. Then I hear in an interview late in his life, um, him talk about his primary influences as a philosopher was, and he, he actually spent so much time not talking about the fact he he would just say I'm not a Zen master, I am not a practitioner of Taoism, um, I am not 
uh, even a Hindu scholar. I'm just proposing some weird ideas and breaking down um, many of these concepts for a Western audience. And he had a beautiful melodic British accent that uh, just made it very entertaining and just entertaining. And yet, I felt like there was so much truth to it and to what he espoused that then I hear our 2,734 or something like that, that his primary influences were Vedanta and Christianity. He also spent five years as a uh, Episcopalian priest uh, when in his thirties um, before uh, becoming this, this um, translator of sorts between East and West. And so then I, I became interested in, well, what is, what is Vedanta? And it was a very cursory interest. And then um, through a few series of events, it just, the philosophy presented itself to me more, uh, I think more fully. And I, I was able to um, ingest parts of it. And I felt like, okay, that is, that is the philosophical worldview. Just even the word philosophy is, is too superfluous. I think it is just a worldview, an orientation, just like if your compass is mapped north and oriented north, then that can set, you can get to, you can sail across seven oceans with that orientation and that very simple orientation. For me, this was a very simple orientation that then has, in I mean, it inspires how I brush my teeth to how I approach this podcast. It's a simple, but very, very uh, broad uh, application of this orientation. And uh, Ajay, I think your name was Ajay. Yeah, Ajay, I will try to break down um, what Vedanta is uh, in in 90 seconds. And then if you're interested in, in more, go check out the episode. Uh, go check out Alan Watts or check out uh, Vedanta Treatise. Um, although I would tell you read Vedanta Treatise two pages a day max and just think about it for 10 minutes after you read each you know, subset of two pages. It's not a book to just crush through. But the first chapter of the book and none of it is woo-woo, mystic, mystical. It is all super rational. Um, and and I'll just tell you, um, although it might not seem it if, I, if you hear this, it'll get a little radical here in a second. But the first uh, quote-unquote chapter of Vedanta, um, and I think this is part of Vedanta Treatise as well, uh, more literally, but the first chapter is basically life is a stream of experiences. And a good life or bad life is determined by whether it's a good stream of experiences or a bad stream of experiences. Pretty easy to follow. And a unit of an experience in this stream is a subject and its environment. The subject and object, the person and the circumstance, the animal and the world, if that animal is about to freeze to death, that's an experience, probably a pretty negative one. So you have the subject and its environment. And in Vedanta, it would say um, this end of knowledge, which is is built off of um, these scriptures called the Upanishads. Um, And it would say in that dichotomy of an experience, the subject and the environment, you can't change the environment. So you might as well just focus the energy on changing the subject working inwardly. And in many ways, uh, Western philosophy is consumed by the infinite without, and Eastern philosophies, this is an oversimplification, but directionally correct, Eastern philosophies are um, focused on the infinite within. You know, you have a Western philosophy that's avoid this fiery pit and uh, pursue this um, heavenly paradise uh, and external infinitude. And you have an in, a Eastern philosophy um, like Vedanta or Buddhism, which is go in, inwardly until you're off the wheel of entanglement. Um, go inwardly, go towards that infinite internal until self-realization, uh, awakening, um, satori, 
um, there's a million words for it, nirvana, and, um, and it's an inward journey. And as a CEO, as a startup founder, as a creator, so much of our, so much of our navigation is an internal one. So much of our reflection each day is how little we can control the environment. In fact, so much of wanting to create, so much of wanting of me wanting to create a startup was, I want to do this so that I can create control my external environment. All of these just false notions of I'll be my own boss, I'll control my own destiny, um, I will achieve financial self sufficiency, and then you you get six months in, twelve months in, six years in, and you realize, holy shit, this is not an effort towards self-aggrandizement. This is just a, if you approach it with those, those, you know, destinations in mind, uh, you realize, okay, I've got a thousand customers, a thousand bosses. I've got 80 employees, 80 bosses. I have this market that is shifting on me left and right. We don't have control of our own destiny uh, at all compared to, you know, you're one of 5,000 people at a large company and you get to just chill in the, Maybe it's not the first class seat of the plane, but you get to chill in economy. You don't have to fly the plane. Instead, yeah, you quote unquote, or you're in the the uh, the pilot seat, but there are storms every ten miles um, that you have to navigate around. You realize just how just how tormenting that environment can be, and you realize, okay, this is a um, whether you do it voluntarily or involuntarily, you go inward. And sometimes that's a pleasant place to go. And, and oftentimes it's actually, um, for me, it was very harrowing and very, uh, it was just so turbulent uh, because I didn't have a proper psyche for creation. And that first chapter of Vedanta is, uh, is essentially just in that stream of experiences. You could either try to fix the, the environment um, or you can try to go inward and, and fix the subject. That made so much sense to me. And it actually just essentially just cut off 99% of the pursuits that I had that were these external pursuits, whether it was accum- accumulation, um, whether it was attachment to uh, this you know personal, personal wealth graph going up into the right, whether it was self-aggrandizement and personal reputation going up into the right, is it going in the right direction? Am I jumping through each hoop sufficiently well to where I will be looked, you know, well upon and and all of these uh, and then the the last thing being just seeking pleasure, all five of my senses. It's like uh, you know, you want the room to be 72 degrees and in so many pursuits that I would have, it was just, how do I get the equivalent across every sense, every, you know, touch, smell, taste, um, comfort in every sense. How do I get that equivalent of just that perfect temperature across every sense? And the world was just way too dynamic and it was shifting so much. And, uh, I just, I guess I reached rock bottom of trying to adjust the dial to 72 degrees across every facet of life and felt like I needed to go internal to be able to handle the 48 degrees um, or the metaphorical 131 degrees and anything and everything in between. And um, I'll skip through the middle of Vedanta because I think it's, although there aren't that many concepts to it, it's it's fairly simple uh, philosophy. But I will get to the last chapter. The last chapter of Vedanta is, um, is essentially seemingly insane and radical and the last chapter of it metaphorically speaking uh, not necessarily just you know in a book on vedanta who knows what each last chapter is but metaphorically speaking the last chapter of it you get through the philosophy and the seemingly insane part is that um, it proposes that all of this is an illusion that the world in front of you right now even the consumption of this podcast going in your little ear holes is an illusion. We think it's real. And um, the canonical uh, allegory is, is our dreams. We have 
dreams every night where we would swear in the midst of that dream that these walls, these people, this scenario, this emotion, this conflict is real. If you remember your dreams every night, then you have examples of this every night. If you remember them, you know, once a week or once a month, um, or if you don't remember them anymore, but you remember them when you were younger, we all have the allegories of these situations that we think are absolutely real and are completely convinced to where we don't even question it when we're in the dream. The ground you're walking on obviously is real because it's supporting you in your dream. And yet we have all of these experiences that then you wake up and immediately you realize none of it was real at all. The perception was real. You perceived a ground, you perceived other people, but the reality was there was no one else there to perceive. And I don't really talk about Vedanta and I actually, I don't even know if I'm doing a good enough job of, of describing what it is um, because it is so, this part of it is so out there. Uh, and I also Really, this podcast is about the guess. But um, when I first heard that, you know, what's interesting is in the last five, six years, as the idea, the proposal that we're living in a simulation has gone from just completely laughable to people then hearing Elon Musk has a great breakdown of, of why mathematically we are likely living in a simulation. Um, and the long and short of it is basically Look at video game graphics in the last 40 years since Pong and two little paddles and a ball going up and down a screen to now you have, you know, something like Halo where, uh, where it just looks so freakishly real. Grand Theft Auto, it looks so freakishly real. It still isn't real. It still doesn't actually look that real. Um, but you look at that trend line of where graphics have gone, where computational power has gone, and he looks at it from a purely engineering perspective, whether it's a hundred more years or whether it's a thousand years, that trend line of computational power, it's just inevitably going to continue until it gets to a point where you will plug into the system somehow through a human uh, brain inter- interface or or through you know VR that plugs in so uh, just... Uh, seamlessly with your senses that you'll be able to jump into a game know that you're in a game but everything will feel real and that's not that crazy to imagine if you look at the trend line of the last 40 years of a video game graphics and where things could be a thousand years from now he, you know he's very um he emphasizes whether you think it's a hundred years from now a thousand years from now it doesn't matter but a thousand years from now, let's say computational power is there. It's probably an overshoot. It's probably easily going to get there to where you put on advice and you feel all senses, smell, touch, sense, you know, sight, everything. And, um, and it, then he goes on to say that world will feel real. You will further want to go into just f- absolutely believing it's real, choosing to believe it's real for the drama of the choice to play any video game. And it's going to get to the point where everybody can have, not only 7 billion people can have their own individual uh, worlds and universes, simulations, but also you can choose from a near infinite number of them. And let's say there's a billion to choose from. There's going to be a time in in the world where there, and this is his argument, but I'll, I'll tell you why I'm bringing this up in a second. It's inevitable, 1,000 years from now, 100 years from now, that you're going to have a billion simulations and you're going to have one base reality and that it is inevitable that many people maybe not all but many people will want to choose a crazy adventure and really get lost in that adventure in that simulation in that video game and it's going to feel so real that they will feel like it is real and that's going to be a feature not like a bug of like oh wait this feels too real it's going to be part of the innovation. So mathematically, you have one base level reality and you have a thousand, five thousand, five billion simulations to choose from. And therefore, what are the chances that we're living in the base reality given over the next thousand years or in human uh, progress, we are going to have a billion other realities to choose from. 
quote unquote realities to choose from simulated realities. Uh, well, it'd, the odds would be one in a billion. So one in a billion that we're living in the base reality. And just the last five years of that going from completely laughable to now very, very smart people entertain it. Um, to where we actually have a, a guest on the podcast um, and Donald Hoffman, where you can listen to his episode, gave a phenomenal TED Talk on this as well, where he and his partner at MIT have mathematically proven the chances that we can see reality, the base level reality. Mathematically, they have proven the chances that we can see what's really going on is 0%. Won't go into the all of the brilliant but uh, just articulate reasons of why they say that, but you have all of these different parts of really smart um, intellectual thought coming up with similar conclusions that maybe this isn't what we see isn't real. Vedanta is a 5,000-year-old version of this, and it uses its analog as a dream. You think it's absolutely real, and yet um, none of it is real. The perception is that it's real, and yet that is the illusion. Christianity actually has some elements of this as well, where you have the permanent, uh, eternal, uh, with someone like God, that then creates, and Judaism as well, that then creates a world on top of that permanent reality, like a painting on a canvas. And what is really there is God's reality, and what is almost like a hologram on top of it, you can say this stuff is quote unquote real like this table. And yet, shit, if God's going to make a, a hologram, he's going to make it the best damn hologram there is to where it's not just going to look real. Every sense will think it's real. And that's a creation on top of a base reality, which is um, God. Um, in fact, Vedanta talks about what is real is what is permanent. And so an illusion is just uh what is impermanent, what is um, not quite just a hallucination, um, but in that direction. And, um, and that is, is basically uh, the last chapter of uh, Vedanta. And, and so you have these two bookends of super simple to super radical, and, uh, and yet presented in a very rational uh, way, a way that none of us will hear very, uh, very often, especially growing up in, in a country like the U S. Um, but nonetheless, uh, has some rationale behind it, even in the midst of pretty insane, radical proposition. So Ajay, that is, uh, Vedanta. Um, I won't go into too much detail of why, for some reason that is so pacifying to my mind um, to th to think about those uh, the world and the, uh, have a worldview that is anchored in those two things and there's there's a richness within Vedanta that isn't um, covered within those just those two bookends of the the chapters but um, there is yeah I, I could talk about it for another twenty minutes of of why I why I gravitated towards this uh, philosophy, especially as a creator, an entrepreneur, uh, adventurer. But I think we're all adventurers. And I think we're all creators. I think that that is, we are most, we're all called to be useful to our communities. And we're all most useful to our communities when we know how to create. Um, so um, I think that this is something that I do think over the next hundred years, I think there's going to be a resuscitation of this. Just like I would invest in a startup like Clubhouse, I would I would invest in this philosophy as something that this is, um, I think this will become bigger and bigger over the next hundred years as a uh, potential worldview that is maybe entertained more, more widely than a tiny, narrow um, part of the population that, that takes uh, something like uh, Advaita Vedanta seriously. Hopefully that answers uh, your question in some sense, and then uh, probably Vedanta Treatise would be the best uh, next step to answer it more if you want to hear more about uh, about Vedanta. And hopefully that wasn't too strange and out there for, for the listeners that had no idea what they were getting into when they 
clicked on uh, this video or listened to this episode. Well, that has been another episode of Below the Hotline. And as you can see, anywhere in the intersection uh, and topography of creation, philosophy, and technology, feel free to send us a question. We love hearing from listeners. So feel free to call the hotline number in the show notes and drop a question of your own. Um, I assume the, uh, the programming will likely return towards more practical matters in future episodes, but this was, um, this was interesting to go into uh, something that is a, such a big part of, of my worldview and my mind share um, on a podcast built for creators. Hope you enjoy it. And until next time, this is Below the Line.